Presence is felt most keenly in absence. I wondered about the absence of flashbacks last week since we had seen that an actor was cast to play Mariko's father in her brief memory of him in the first episode. This week we do go back and learn not only about Mariko and Buntaro, but also about her relationship with the younger girl named Rory, who grew up to be Ochiba no Kata. I opted not to go too deep into the background of the historical characters that these two are based on, because I thought the show might change things, and because the thing I kept going back to as I was reading about them was the idea that history is written by the victors. If you listen to the official podcast, you can imagine me saying exactly out loud whenever they brought this up at the beginning of that. Most of the historical stuff I read made it sound like her father did everyone a favor by killing his boss without coming out and saying that. This is something people were in support of. He probably didn't get the idea or follow through with it on his own, but after the fact, the Tycho returned to avenge his master and then consolidated his power from there. We get a glimpse of the brutality of the show's version, Corrado, through the eyes of a very young Mariko as he beheads a trio of monks. This is based on a historical event where her father was ordered to attack a temple of warrior monks and several thousand people, including their extended families, were killed. In the show's version of events, a young Toronaga restrains a catchy Jinsai while Mariko and Rory comfort each other in the midst of the chaos. These girls grew up in a violent period, which is why the Taiko is revered for the relative peace he ushered in during his rule. But again, the victors write the history, and since this episode fills in some of the blanks about her providing him an heir, it makes me think about one of the craziest stories I read about him. As the show highlights, his wife Lady Eo couldn't produce an heir. In all attempts by an extensive number of consorts were unsuccessful. He decided to adopt his nephew to secure the line and made him his heir only to be surprised when the concubine Ochiba is based off gave him a healthy son. He became the heir and then the Taiko ordered his nephew to commit seppuku on trumped up charges of treason. And because they might seek revenge he also killed most of his family. But to keep the focus on this episode, we see these two grow up, and in a training scene where we're reminded that Mariko can hold her own with a Naganada, we see a young Butaro checking out his future wife. She's not happy with her father's choice, which is a little confusing since his father, Hiramatsu, is Toronaga's right-hand man. But this is more about how connected her family was before her father died. And it's a nice turn that in her devastation, her friend, Ochiba, tries to convince her that they've got it pretty good and that they should choose to look away from what they can't control. This sets up the main takeaway from their relationship. They both lost their fathers and have been fighting ever since. Adult Mariko will tell Toronaga that men can go to war for a variety of reasons, but women are simply at war. After seeing this glimpse into their shared past, we have a much better idea of how she came to that conclusion. As this plays out, we see that they react to their personal fights in different ways, and this is what I really like about the flashbacks being from different perspectives. You don't know how much is absolutely true, and how much is colored by experience. And since the history will be written by the victors, it's fantastic to get deeper insight into how the potential winners and losers are navigating the conflict. Episode 6 is more about how Ochiba got to where she is, though. In the present day, we see that Ishido has put the torch to Toronaga's carrier pigeons and learned that he's taken the regents and their families hostage. After Hiramatsu makes his dramatic escape from Osaka, having to leave Lady Kiri and Shizu behind, Delacqua is furious that he's been turned away at the castle, and Alvido correctly assesses that Lady Ochiba must now be calling the shots. As she's sitting with her son, we see a memory of when she had to leave her home after her father was killed to balance this all out. She gets woken up in the middle of the night, learns that he's dead, and gets whisked away after being told to never return. In an instant, everything that she had is gone, and everything that she'll get, she'll have to take back. The no play, intercut with her memories of what it's depicting, is about as straightforward an example as I think we'll ever get from this show. And a really compelling way to set up Ochiba as a worthy adversary for Toronaga. 
We hear Shugiyama and the region squabble while Io tries to tell Ochiba she's making the wrong choice with Ishido. And her motivations seem to be somewhat different than they were in the books. But from what the show lays out in the first half of this episode, she doesn't seem to be completely off base in her fear of throwing in with Toronaga, who she believes was behind the plot to kill her father. If you think it through, ever since her father died, she's had to derive the power she's been able to claw back for herself through her connections with men, first with the Taiko, and now with her son. With Ishido, she sees someone she can control, while with Toronaga, she sees someone who might use her for his ends and then discard her. Delac was warning to Alvido that his Minawara is in the same vein. We haven't seen much of the Catholics since Toronaga escaped Osaka, but their current situation is somewhere on the scale between complicated and impossible. Toronaga looked like a wild card they couldn't trust, but Ochiba is openly hostile. With her controlling the regents, whoever is on the other side starts to look good to the church. The circle back to the play, which isn't there a nice built-in comparison between politicians and actors, but to get back to the way Ochiba remembers her experience, seeing the memory of the drug they gave her to help her conceive, and then hearing that a woman may lose everything she's ever had, but she may also take it back, really emphasizes her direction. And then being told she must stare without fear into the cruel eyes of fate and make herself seen, only for her to add to that in one of her best scenes when she tells Ishido, so that I could scratch out its eyes. Things are officially getting interesting in Osaka, and the actor has a great presence that she carries so naturally every time we see her. Back in Ajiro, they're picking up the pieces after the earthquake. Toronaga addresses his remaining troops at a burial ceremony where he takes the opportunity to promote the engine for saving his life again. The way the camera jumps from Buntaro to Yabashige and to Omi, all while Blackthorn has this, I guess that's cool, but I don't even want any of this stuff look on his face, feels like something we should be paying attention to. Yabu and Omi have reason to be concerned. They have lost a lot. Thousands are dead in their region. They're no longer in control of their army. And being in control of the cannon regiment was something that elevated their importance. Omi seems jealous of the barbarian, which his uncle points out. And what isn't mentioned is the promises he's made to Ashido. And all of that's important. As is Toronaga telling Buntaro he should get a divorce, and then telling him to stay away from Mariko for seven days. Buntaro laying out his motivations, and his jealousy, I guess for lack of a better term, is important information. And definitely the idea of Crimson Sky. The plan to lead an all-out assault on Osaka Castle and remove the regents forcibly before installing Toronaga as the single ruler. That involves the name of the show as the title he would take, so of course his becoming Shogun would be a big deal. The introduction of Crimson Sky is funny in that he brings it up to say he definitely doesn't want to do that, just as he doesn't want to become Shogun. That he's so sure that he doesn't want that, and he makes a point of bringing it up, makes it all feel a little suspicious. It makes you wonder about how much of what he says you can believe. Everyone in the room seems to be behind both ideas, especially his son. I thought it stood out how he turned the conversation to Omi, asking him what he thinks, while at the same time we see him with Kiku behind closed doors complaining about Blackthorn again. Whether we can believe Toronaga or not seems important in relation to his reveal that Mariko's father married him to Bentaro to protect her, hoping that one day she could continue his fight. This changes her thoughts about her entire life, essentially. Initially, it makes her think that she's failed her father, but Toronaga assures her that her war isn't over. This does restore her purpose, which is something he brought up when he first enlisted her to be his translator, but it also just kind of fits for exactly what he needs from her in the moment. Also important is the new regent, Lord Ito, who should be able to get them the votes to impeach Toronaga. But the thing that stays with you is how well-drawn Ochiba comes out of this episode and this remarkably sexy scene in the sex house that doesn't actually have any sex in it. We get there with the help of two primer scenes along the way. 
The first one happens when Blackthorn returns home and hears Mariko praying in Latin through the house's thin walls. He drops to his knees on the opposite side and starts praying in English, which makes for this amazingly intimate moment where they're together in a sense, but also physically in two different spaces. Then the real buildup begins when Blackthorn goes in front of Tornaga for further clarification on why he's getting all these new titles when he really just wants to leave or to attack the black ship and take it to the Portuguese. Neither of these ideas further Tornaga's interests, so he dismisses them. There is obvious tension between the Anjin and Mariko, something their lord noticed the last time they were in front of him before the earthquake. So as they bicker and argue, at one point the translation process breaks down completely when Mariko gets offended by his continued digs at the Catholics, Toranaga comes up with a brilliant idea. He orders Mariko to set up a brothel encounter for Blackthorn and to go with him to translate and help the process go smoothly. And I say it's brilliant because it works for him no matter how things turn out. He can tell they have a relationship. Maybe he doesn't know exactly what's going on, but he can see that something's there. Just as he didn't want to intervene when his top warrior was beating his only translator, it would be much better for him if they could just work this out themselves and get back to following through with their duties. Just as the doctor tried to prescribe him a pillowing, if nothing is going on, this could just be therapeutic. If they are intimate, as many people are starting to believe, then having her accompany him to a pleasure house in her professional role works as a way to cover up their affair. When Mariko goes to arrange the visit, we meet another new character named Gin. We see that she drives a hard bargain for Kiku's services, and the actor makes a good first impression. She's a little bit outshined though because this scene also provides us with what I think is probably the best Fuji reaction shot in the series, which is crazy when you think about how many good ones there have been. When Gin asks if Mariko will be joining Blackthorn because after all she's heard that they're never seen apart, Fuji reacts and then takes a sip of her tea to cover it up. But just for the quickest second her eyes shoot down and back up and it really is an amazing bit of facial acting. This Willow World scene manages to top that, and even though Kiku isn't a new character, this felt like our first proper introduction. This has felt like a fairly faithful adaptation, only that the perspective has been brought in to include the Japanese point of view. They've left some key things out, which I'm not sure that they won't go back to, but it still very much feels like it's going to the same place. The tone of this scene in the setup is notably completely different, and I think it's a welcome change. In the book, this is a lot more direct, and plays as Blackthorn's education or his being enlightened by how open the Japanese are in regard to the pleasures of sex. The show touches on that and I think it's been implied throughout, but the tension that exists between the two of them is much more compelling. And it opens the door for this really great trick they pull off, which I'll get to in a second. When they arrive at the tea house, it's apparent that this is a high class establishment. After Gin welcomes them and leads them to a room, Kiku makes a grand entrance that says more about the services she offers than the variety of sex toys she introduces them to in the book. She's clearly very skilled at her job, which comes through the small details like how she pours the sake. Gin wasn't lying when she claimed her ladies were artists of the very very first class. But perhaps more than anything else, Kiku's gift of reading her clientele seems to be where her real talent lies. So as she's describing what a night with her really offers her customers, an escape and untold pleasure, she realizes the effect it's having on both of them. She addresses this directly in an exchange that Mariko doesn't translate, and then finds a way to say the things that Mariko wants to say and Blackthorn wants to hear. Then she slips to the translator's side out of view, and Mariko's translation shifts from saying she will do these things to saying I, just basically repeating. And it's almost as if the eightfold fence has been completely broken down. I could just repeat the whole thing here because it's that good, but then that really wouldn't do it justice. Anna Sawai's delivery and the way the camera watches and then lingers on Cosmo Jarvis's longing, it really is something. She ends by saying, I ask you into my openness. And that brings back a flood of memories that cause her to stop before Kiku invites Blackthorn into a private room. She also makes the invitation to Mariko, but she doesn't give John that option. 
which I suppose makes sense. They have reason to worry that people would talk. As private as she says it is, it probably isn't. But then they do touch hands as she leaves, which is the perfect to-be-continued gesture, and probably hotter than if she just joined them. This may be the climax, but it's not the ending. Even though it looked as if Ishido found the right replacement for Toronaga, taking the other regions hostage ended up backfiring. Shugiyama refuses to fall in line, and Ishido has to answer to Ochiba, which is when she tells him that she made fate look at her so that she could scratch out its eyes. When Shugiyama tries to flee, Ishido makes his move to exterminate him and everyone that's with him. Back in Ajiro, Toronaga rallies his troops and tells them that he expects to be impeached and for war to be declared on his clan. But if this means the Taiko's heir would be in danger, then he has no choice but to defend him. Crimson Sky it will be. The time has come to obliterate his enemies, and this episode comes to an end with his men cheering. I guess what he doesn't express is why the heir would be in danger if it's his mother who is trying to hold on to power pulling the strings. But it's just like Sugiyama and his family getting killed by bandits. Sometimes inexplicable things happen. So we have two well-matched adversaries and the stakes are real. The show continues to impress and things that were already good like the costumes seem to even be getting better as it progresses, which is really just something. Whoever comes out on top will get to write the story that will become history. And this Blackthorn and Mariko situation is kind of hot too. Can't wait to see where things go next. And I think that is a great place to leave things. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching, I'll talk to you soon.